the grav cycle crash at the beginning is the is the favorite thing I've done sound design for on the project. So um, okay, <laughs> the more people that can hear that, even compressed, is good. <laughs> we compress it right. We do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Devastating storms, economic collapse, rampant disease. Our world can be a terrifying place, but it doesn't have to be. Here at Sangfroid, we have perfected the process of integration. Through this simple procedure, you can preserve the very best part of yourself. The one organ that defines you as you. I integrated because of you. We all live with our choices. Those who didn't resist were shipped off to the Iron Clouds to be rayon slave soldiers. Those who resisted, well, you all know that story. Your people should be prepared. What do you think we should do? Well, we're in deep already. Tell me what you need. Surely you don't actually believe in this pathetic cause. But I'm gonna tell you now. I'm offering you true freedom. I've seen what you call freedom. And the only freedom I want is with these people. My allies. My friends. You're listening to Tone Vendors, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Welcome to Tone Vendors. My name is Renee Coronado, and with me today, as always, it's Tim Muirhead. Hey, Tim. Hey, Renee. How you doing? I am hanging in there, I guess. <laughs> it's, <laughs> this is such a loaded question. <laughs> Anymore. It's dangerous to ask that. Joining us also is Jack Menhorn. Hey, Jack, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So Jack Menhorn is the lead sound designer for V1 Interactive. He also worked on Lawbreakers, Nova 111, and dozens of Indian mobile games. You can find him on Twitter at Jack Menhorn, and you can find his website, jackmenhorn.com. So the reason we're on here is we're talking about the new game that just dropped, Disintegration. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you got started with the project and when it first came to you, the way you approached what your role was going to be in it. Yeah. So I started at V1 back in 2017, which was seems like so long ago. And I signed on to the team, moved from North Carolina out to Seattle, where we're at now. And so from the beginning, I kind of knew that the project was going to be about robots flying around. And that's super exciting. I love robots. So... Once we got started, I just kind of dug in and had a lot of fun making robot sounds and robot voices and most importantly, robot explosions. There you go. So you're the lead. How big is your audio team on this project? Two. For most of the production, or actually all of the production of Disintegration, I was the only full-time sound person. We had an on-site contractor throughout production, as well as towards the end, we had some external contractors as well as we have our contractor composer working with us as well. And were you the one that was in charge of coordinating all of that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, I was in charge of herding all of the cats as well as probably about 90% of all of the sound design, 90% of the implementation, as well as voice processing and sitting in on all of the recording sessions and all of that. Wow. That's a lot of work. I mean, considering the scope of the game, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think in all departments, uh, we were very ambitious. Like uh, V1 Interactive is only 30 people. And I think we managed to make something that's pretty on par with AAA expectations. So we're all pretty proud of that. So we all got to wear a lot of hats. (laughs) So as you're working with the storytellers and the creatives and the team leads, how are you approaching what you're going to bring to the story in terms of the audio side? What's great about the small team is whenever I'm working on the sound, I can just walk over to them and go, hey, what were you thinking here? Or what do you have in mind here in terms of mechanics as well as story? Because I kind of consider myself a game developer first and a sound designer second. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm thinking, okay, this weapon needs a sound pass. Well, what does this weapon need to communicate mechanically? Is this a strong weapon? Is this a weak weapon? Is this a good guy or a bad guy weapon, that sort of thing, like talking with the designers about mechanics. Okay, so how long is this charge up sequence going to be? Does this charge up sequence need to be the scary part? Or do you want the fire to be the scary part? Like communicating with them about that. And then the same thing with the story, talking with our lead uh, writer, as well as cinematic director, creator, uh, Lee Wilson, I spent a lot of time with that man throughout the production of, of Disintegration to get exactly what he and through him, our creative director, Marcus Leto had in mind. So starting with casting, he and I with Marcus listening to every audition and deciding which one together, what what we would do. And then we sat in either through Skype or on site, every recording session we had for the game. So that way we both made sure him story-wise and me gameplay wise got what we needed out of all of the VO. And then once we got all of those lines, we sat there and Frankenstein every single line together in order to get exactly what we needed out of the performances. What was the scope of the VO? I just had my junior sound designer, Thomas, calculate that we had 5,871 lines in the game. Across how many characters? Oh, a good bit. I'd say 15, 16. Yeah. But a lot of that was also combat chatter. So a lot of, got it, Roger. That counted as a line, but, you know, also like a paragraph soliloquy kind of counted as a line as well. (laughs) So for a small team, that was a good bit. But when I started out, I knew we were going to be up against the wall towards the end, as sound usually is. So we set up some kind of processes and automations in mind for that, like getting spreadsheets into Reaper, getting sounds out of Reaper in an efficient way. Do you want to? Yes, boy. My tooth fell out. (laughs) Your tooth fell out. Holy moly, yeah, look. Look, hold on. His tooth fell out. Wow. Nice. High five, kiddo. Let me see your smile. Ah, it fell out. (laughs) (laughs) That's the first one. Oh, nice. Did you yank it? I actually didn't. No? Just fell out. Okay. Good job, kiddo. We'll go get ice cream later, okay? Okay. All right, let me finish. (laughs) I'm leaving it in. Nice. (laughs) Um, <laughs> do you want to explain those uh, Reaper systems that you were yeah, doing to say, I, facilitate I'd love to that? Dive into some of the details of that if you could. Oh yeah, so like we starting off, I knew we were going to be the sound team was going to be kind of responsible for tracking all those assets in the script. So we set up a Google Sheets conditional formatting, like most asset tracking spreadsheets: the line, the character name, the status of it. If it's already recorded, if it's just written, if it's a temp line, that sort of thing as well as the conditional formatting to automatically generate that file name in that spreadsheet that then could be exported as a CSV and then imported into Reaper and automatically make the regions and name those regions the file name. So that way, once we got the recording sessions back, we just plopped all of those takes in each of the appropriate regions for each line, which then made it easy for me to go through either by myself or with Lee and go, okay, well, I like this performance. I like this take. So I'll use this one, mute the other ones in that region. And then with Reaper, Reaper does great wildcards. So you can render out files by region name. So then boom, you just hit render with the appropriate wildcard and then just render out all of the characters or all of the performances you needed with the appropriate names. You, there's no manual naming or renaming that needs to happen. Then you can just tops and tails it and just drop it in the game. And then with a lot of lines, especially with a lot of combat chatter, we recorded a lot of extensive temp VO. So it made it really easy that we already had that standardized naming set up. And then, so when we added actually in the final lines, it was just dropping them in our middleware wise and it automatically worked without much fuss. 
Right. Did you guys get any tempitis? Uh, no, because, uh, <laughs> you did it bad enough. <laughs> well, so starting out, I tried to involve a lot of the team and in, in a lot of different character voices, but as everyone got busy, it pretty much became all masculine characters were me and all feminine characters were Rachel, our office manager. So hearing me and, and Rachel over and over, everyone got pretty sick of it. But one of the characters, Doyle, had was real gruff and, you know, oh, kind of a sassy jerk. Um, <laughs> And we did kind of cast the character a bit closer to that performance, but I think that's more up to my excellent performance of Doyle that we, <laughs> we had to, to find someone that matched me more than anything else. <laughs> and obviously you guys didn't just take the raw recordings and drop them in there. You did a lot of processing to the voices on their way in. And a lot of the processing was specific to the different characters. Can you spell out? The process of developing the processing for the character. <laughs> yeah, I could talk about the process of the process process. Um, <laughs> well, how did you come up with the various uh, tricks and techniques that you did to make people sound like they did in the game? Because there's a lot of like, just unique, cool stuff going on. Uh, yeah, it was probably one of the most stressful parts of the project for me because, I mean, this was the first big game that I was the head of the, the sound on. And I had never really done a lot of VO processing and finalization like i've done like on lawbreakers i did a bunch of video editing and implementation and stuff but this time i had cinematics to worry about and making the character come out so i was very adamant that we spent the time on temp vo because out of the 12 characters in the story campaign of disintegration 10 of them are robots they're humans but they're in a robot mechanical armature we only have two human we call them natural characters so you know i was pretty nervous about kind of making that work and still having emotion come through so we spent a lot of time with the temp vo and my doyle performances and <laughs> processing those and tweaking those listening to those in our previous cinematics as well as in game and figuring out like, oh, is the intelligible, is the character coming through? The process might be cool, but like if you can't understand them in a combat scenario or like you lose the nuance of a performance, it's doing a disservice. So we spent a good bit of time with temp natural VO because we considered using, you know, the robotic like text to speech stuff, but that would have saved us a lot of time <laughs> in temp VO, but we would have I would have paid for it once we got the final performances and trying to make them come alive with the VO. But once we got the final VO, I had spent so much time on temp chains for the most part with a lot of the, the hero good guy characters, it was dropping in what we had already done and then kind of just adjusting it for their vocal qualities and, and performances. And then from a philosophical standpoint, I'm looking at your chains here, right? And we'll put the screenshots to some of your chains up there. I'm seeing EQs, I'm seeing crystallizers. I'm seeing fab filters and echo boys and decapitators and Valhalla rooms and things like that. There's just stacks and stacks of stuff on here. And I'll play a little bit of, let's play a little bit of Agnes. Here's what Agnes sounds like. You think folks like us would ever get a gravestone? You got it, sugar. Under fire! We'll get you out! I'm, I'm just remembering. He always said if he ever got off that nasty cloud, the first thing he'd do is find his family. So... Even though there's stacks and stacks of stuff on there, there's still a lot of intelligibility. And that was the thing that was so impressive to me was how much you could still hear the actor's performance and how much of that survived that deep chain of processing and how much still the processing was doing its job and putting the human being inside the robot armature. Yeah, I think the regular chain is like a Q3, DS, or Pro C, Valhalla, Pro C, Q3, L2. The most of the heavy lifting there is the Valhalla room, um, which is my favorite reverb. If I need a reverb, I first just drop that on and, and see if it gets me where it needs to. And a lot of the time it does. And a VO advice I got from my good friend, Matt Martinson is in a VO chain, taking baby steps with the processing, use a little compression to get most of the way there and then use another compressor to kind of dial that in. And that was really successful, especially on characters like Agnes. and. The overall direction I got from Lee and Marcus at V1 was we want to hear the performances. We want to hear the characters because if you look at screenshots of disintegration, these armature characters, they're integrated, hence disintegration where 
since they're integrated characters, they're in these robot bodies that have no mouths. They have no noses. They're face plates with eyes. So any nuance or emotion is almost entirely done by the VO. There's body language that our excellent animators put together to help reinforce how they're feeling. But for the most part, VO is the star of the show in these performances. So it's important that it comes through. So the philosophy I took forward with the outlaw integrated characters, the, the heroes of the story, is more of just that glossy sheen, a bit C-3PO-like, where you get all of the character, but especially when you listen to that voice next to a human character that doesn't have that processing, then that contrast is really where it comes through. I think my life would have been harder had we no human characters if it was just entirely integrated characters, I think the listener would actually start tuning out that processing over time. But being able to hear a character that doesn't have it, and then you hear a character that does, you're like, oh, yeah, they sound a little boxy. They sound a little glossy. And that's really what we went for with the the characters. But then I did give you a chain screenshot for it. But in that example of Agnes, some of the VO was also over radio, which was where I would say over half, if not more of the performances came through is during gameplay, you as the main character are in a floating graph cycle and you're commanding two to four characters on the ground. And in the combat chatter, they'll chat with you and like, you'll command them to go, Hey, go over there. They'll go, got it, Roger or enemy ahead, that sort of thing. And that's over radio. So for that, I use Melda ring modulator. And actually I used two because again, it was baby steps. It's like one got me most of the way there, but then another one with a slightly different setting helped kind of just dial it in. Which ring modulator did you say? Uh, Melda. So you did send us that screenshot. So you got a couple of fab filters, two Melda ring modulators, decapitator, and then more fab filter EQs. Oh yeah, yeah, there I did. You got multiple stages of EQs going on there. Yeah. And we did hear the the radio in that. Is there radio on Black Shuck here? No, Black Shuck is our Rayon evil character. So ah. he, he has his own special filter on him because, brief backstory, the Rayon are kind of the big company organization that helped make everyone become integrated. They advertised it as a way to get past this disease that was kind of taking over and like, oh, we'll put your body in a in an armature. And then once the disease is gone and there's a cure, we'll clone your body and then we'll just put it in a new one. And then over time, they everyone realized, well, maybe that's not true. And then more authoritarian government overtook and they um, now will forcibly integrate naturals out in the world and functionally lobotomize them and, and turn them into these mindless soldiers. But there's a much more of a transhumanist philosophy to them. And Black Shuck prescribes to that philosophy of the human body is weak. So he's got more of a, a Vader, Kylo Ren distortion to him. A little bit because how I justified it to myself fictionally was Black Shuck sounds a lot more grating and, and rough because when Black Shuck is speaking English, he's speaking a foreign language. Hmm. Like the Rayon have their own their own language now because they're transhuman. They could speak in bursts of noise and you know sound like modems if they wanted to because they're actually speaking dense information to each other. So when Shuck speaks English, when he deigns to lower himself to speak <laughs> English to our heroes when he's trying to get something from them, He's actually having to take a voice box that's optimized for rayon speak and use it for English. So it's actually rougher because it's not actually designed to be in the human hearing spectrum. So let's hear some Black Shuck. Join the rayon. Let your eyes see red. Leave those weak and nostalgic ideas behind. I thought a collaboration had made you wiser. It's a generous offer. Don't choose the alternative. Do you really want to be sold off for parts? So soon forgotten. Yeah, that's an evil dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. One of the other things that I was really impressed with as I was watching some gameplay yesterday was the mix and how clear and present all the voices were in the midst of gameplay while simultaneously there being all this weapon fire going on at the same time. I know you had a very complex process for putting that together. I'd love for you to spell that out a little bit. The unique challenge of this first-person RTS hybrid that we made with Disintegration is 
we're also a vehicular game. So like we're an RTS slash FPS slash not really racing game, but like you're in a grav cycle, which is a floating hovercraft functionally. So that way you have that eye in the sky view, but you also have the sound of a engine always. So imagine a first person shooter character who has like cloth fully. Imagine that never stopping. So like that was a challenging part of the mix. In addition to weapon fires, your own weapon, enemy weapon fires, and then your units communicating, which is your units speaking to you is the most important sound in the game, in my opinion. It's also the most unreliable sound in the game. So why is it so important? Because they're always giving you status updates based on on what's going on. They're letting you know when they see an enemy. They're letting you know when they're taking a lot of damage in a short amount of time. They're letting you know when they're low health. They're letting you know that um, they can't fulfill an order. They're letting you know specific story beats to that mission. Because we have mission dialogue and then we have unit chatter. Unit chatter is all of that reactive, I'm under fire, I can't go there, I'm using my ability, that sort of thing. And then the mission dialogue is the you know story beats specific to, hey, we need to go and take out this generator before we can take out the enemy base and so on. So there's always something that they probably could be informing you about. The, the delicate balance of having them give you appropriate and timely information as well as give important story beats was a pretty big challenge and very important for us to, I think, nail appropriately. And also from a philosophical mix standpoint, I'm one of those people that gets super frustrated if VO is just a little low in the mix to where you have to work to hear it. Yeah. Video games are, can be an inherently frustrating experience, especially if you're still learning about it. So I wanted to make sure that VO was not frustrating in any capacity, especially with, you know, AI units that sometimes do things you don't want them to do. I didn't want VO to be an additional friction point in that process. So let's hear a little bit of some squad command. And then we'll hear some enemy units. And then we'll talk about, from a mix perspective, exactly how you made everything sound so clear in the mix. Here's some squad command. I got it. Right away. All right, which way? So that's them responding to you. And here's the enemy units out there in the world. (laughs) Those guys are pretty... Cool. Those are some scary dudes. And so all of those, they come across just super clean and clear in the midst of battle. And obviously battle is nonlinear, it's interactive, it's unpredictable. So from a mixed perspective, you just have to put structures in place to keep all the voices clean, right? Yeah, so we use WISE as our middleware, but the fundamentals kind of work in any software that you would be using is pretty much just a lot of signal ducking, side chaining of the VO. And outside of UI sounds, um, VO was one of those things that, hey, the VO is happening, so we're gonna duck ambiences. We're gonna duck grav cycle sounds, like your own movement sounds. We're going to duck music. We're going to duck Foley. Even those little units in the world, they have Foley on them. So we made sure to duck that. So it's like anything that isn't critical information outside of the VO, when the VO is happening, we're gonna push that down. So that way it, it really pops through. And fortunately, the since it's coming over radio, it's really easy. It's like, well, it's a stereo file. It doesn't have to be attenuated. It's right there. So that was a, a nice blessing as we didn't have to worry about needing to effectively hear an ally yelling 10 feet away or 50 feet away and still make it sound clear and present in addition to still having it sound realistically attenuated. But when a character is close to you, and they're speaking to you over radio, you still get a little bit of verb because they're still speaking out loud. So you're going to catch a little bit of the reverb. But if they're far away from you, you're not going to get that reverb because they're just too far away for that to carry, which is one of the few ways that really helps communicate spaces in disintegration. And another thing that really helped, it was actually kind of an accident, is we have the chain in Reaper for processing the radio VO to make it sound a little distorted with those ring modulators. But in addition, starting out, what we experimented with was in Wise adding a runtime distortion so that way the more damaged they are, the more beat up they sound. And so we added in, it was actually, I think, just a guitar distortion (laughs) in Wise that increases and decreases based on their health. But I found that In the situation where a character is low health and needs to communicate that they're low health, the last thing you want is them to sound super distorted and choppy. Because again, if you can't understand the state that they're trying to communicate to you, that's a frustrating experience that adds friction I don't think we needed. 
So I turned off the parameterization of it, but I left that distortion on there because I was like, well, it's working. I like the sound of it. And there's no reason for me to go back in Reaper and reverse engineer that sound. But because of that, all of the characters share that same distortion preset and it helps kind of homogenize them a good bit. And then for whatever reason, that extra distortion in low pass, high pass on their voices from that wise preset really helps them pop through, I think. Yeah, that takes up processing cycles in real time to make that happen, right? That was another reason why we turned it off was by having it be that runtime processing, it does cost a little bit. But fortunately in wise, like if you have a plugin on something that doesn't need to shift or change, that doesn't need to be parameterized, you can render that when you generate sound banks. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it costs us nothing except maybe a couple seconds of extra bank generation time, but it wasn't actually that big of an issue. And a character can kind of get stunned and we had a distortion effect for that, or we have a slow field effect that they can get on units. So that way their actions actually slow down. And I added in like a phaser sort of warble to them for that. But again, those were runtime things. And in the entrance of performance, as well as combat clarity, I took those out, but maybe on disintegration too, that's something we can look at. So when you say for the interest of clarity, who's making that call? Are you coming up with what you think you like and then spreading it around the team? Because I always go too far the first time is I guess what I'm trying to say. Do you find you do that as well? No, I find that I'm pretty pragmatic about sound. I want to make things as cool as possible, especially when I have the time to do it. I'll prototype something that just gets the job done and then put that in and then baby step it up to coolness. But functionality is, is baseline. Like there are times I've put in straight up sine waves for weapon charging and stuff, just so that we know that the mechanics are working. But in terms of who makes that call, it was mostly me, especially when it comes to combat chatter. Like the designers just kind of let me do my thing. And then if I ever had a, like a big functionality change or a concern about like something working one way or another, I'd consult them and go, what do you all think about doing this or that? And usually they were completely on board in terms of like the combat chatter. I was as close to the metal as I could get. I was working with our programmer, Nick on the, the chatter system and getting the right functionality that we needed out of it for the combat chatter. I wrote all of those lines and edited all those lines. <laughs> so much of our game is about communicating with our units and them communicating back to you that, I wanted to be involved in every aspect of that to make sure that it could be as good as we could make it. And I think the, in terms of gameplay systems, the combat chatter is the thing I'm most proud of sound wise in the game and asset wise, you know, VO is the thing I'm most proud of in disintegration in terms of just design. What was the collaborative process like structurally with the game designers? In other words, like, were you doing audio specific play tests with audio specific notes or was it just kind of bundled into play tests throughout the rest of it? It was pretty much bundled throughout. Since we're a small team, getting play tests can be challenging because everyone's just trying to work on the game, especially when it comes to multiplayer, because in multiplayer, we have 5v5. So if we have a multiplayer play test going in the studio, that's, <laughs> that's a third of our team working on it at any one time. We would have play tests and then before a play test, designers would be like, hey, we're looking at these mechanics. And then I'd throw in, hey, I added in new voices for these, or now characters will let you know when they're low health, or now characters will let you know when they can't use an ability and adding those in and letting the, the team know about it. We have a Slack chat. And then when any new feature came in, I wanted to make sure that sound had as much visibility as possible to the team. So pretty much any new feature, any new final sound I'm adding to the game, I'm throwing in there so that everyone knows what's going on. So it sounds like you actually had a lot of creative latitude and freedom to do whatever the heck you wanted in this space then. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like um, overall, the team is pretty flat. So if your role is an animator, you're pretty much free to do what you want and then just make sure the boss likes it. And I'm pretty self-driven myself and pretty strong-willed and opinionated myself, but it was pretty, <laughs> <laughs> pretty nice to just kind of, Hey, this is what I want to do. I'll double check with the boss first. And then like I mentioned before, like before I would get started with anything, I'd ask the relevant parties. So for example, the, the rayon, the enemy VO, which is the kind of that exotic language, bursty, barky stuff. I went to Marcus, our creative director. and was like, well, what are you thinking here? And we kind of collaborated on what it could be. And Marcus is about 15 years older than me. And so he was the right age for when Star Wars first came out, mm -hmm. the original trilogy. And I was the right age for the special editions. I was 
like 12, 13. So our common language <laughs> a lot of times was Star Wars. Like, I'm going to make this. What do you think? Oh, well, maybe something like the probe droid or how about this? So like, you know, really like a screech, kind of like a, a TIE fighter, stuff like that. And then with the enemy Rayon, it's like the death troopers from Rogue One, kind of like, you know, that opening scene in there. They're obviously talking to each other, but you can't understand them. And it sounds evil as hell and <laughs> and distorted. That was kind of the jumping off point for the Rayon. And then from there, in that example, we had a couple barks, but then there was kind of like a chattering sort of sound. That's actually for- It's a super cool sound. Thanks. That's our wasp, which is actually a floating weapons platform that kind of looks like a wasp. With that character talking with Marcus, I was like, well, what do you want here? He's like, "What's well, something that kind of fits in with all of the other characters, but is a little less human. And so the fiction that came back from that is like, there's still a human brain can. There's still a human inside that, but because it's less humanoid, it's a little more devolved. It's a little more primitive in its understanding of its own surroundings, as well as its ability to communicate. So it's actually just got this kind of like chittering insectoid aspect to it, which mm. how I came up with that sound was an accident. I was editing in Adobe Audition. I was editing just a regular rayon foot soldier kind of barks and commands. But then if you scrub the timeline, it'll jog and preview a little bit of the sound, but it stutters. So then I pretty much just played back me taking enemy VO and just jogging back and forth and performing with that timeline. And that was kind of the basis of the wasp VO. That's way cool. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> Did you run into any technical challenges with regards to load times, processing cycles, anything else like that? Real-time effects? No, I tried to keep everything as lean and mean as I could. Coming from an indie background, as well as my previous project, Lawbreakers, running into some performance issues towards the end, I didn't want to run into those again. So I tried to run as tight of a ship as I could. I didn't see a reason to inflate my ego with a weapon that has 12 layers and like 15 variations in each container. I wanted to save myself time because, again, I was the only full-time employee. So if things hit the fan, it was my responsibility. And we also had 35 minutes of cinematics towards the end of the project that I also had to run and coordinate. So I knew that my time was always going to be at a premium. So I wanted to make sure from the beginning, we kept everything as lean and mean as we could. So there are complex sounds in the game. Weapons do have a certain number of layers, depending on, on what they are and what they how they need to function. There are a decent number of variations in, in things that I think need them, like the VO, but Foley and stuff, especially Foley that you can't really hear most of the time. I tried to punk rock it as much as I could, like <laughs> get, get there with what we need and nothing more. But we, we do have complex sounds like the graph cycle is a beast audibly as well as mechanically. Like it's a living, breathing thing that the system went through, I think, five different revisions with the the engineer, Chuck, on it. Like he and I hammered on that for a while. Like I think at any one time there's probably eight to 12 sounds coming out of that thing, like either through one shots or loops that are crossfading based on speed and altitude and load of the thumbstick and like stress of going too high because we kind of have a soft ceiling or stress of like fast turns. And those eight to 12 voices that that could be going on in one time is a good chunk of our 100 voice limit, which is pretty low in my experience. You can only audibly hear 100 voices at once anything else is automatically sent to either kill or sent to a virtual voice or something like that. Cause I knew from the beginning we were going to be going on Xbox one and PlayStation four. And those are powerful machines, but there's a lot that goes into a game, not just sound. And so I have my little allotment of performance and I got to make sure that I, I'm doing as much as I can with that. So that way I'm not encroaching on the beautiful art, the beautiful animation, the, the effects, the, skyboxes, the levels and the AI, because we've got a lot going on. We've got a lot of entities in the world that we got to worry about. You mentioned how much is going on. It's an impressive game. And for this to be your first game as audio lead, that's also impressive. I, I wondered if I could ask you just like, what was the most overwhelming part of uh, jumping up that level? What did you find surprising and what did you find that you really handled well? You know, fortunately, you know, we had a pretty lengthy pre-production process, so I was able to ease into a lot of the new responsibilities like handling external contractors and working with the VO talent agencies and stuff like that. I'm also an habitual worrier. 
So I try to squirrel away work as much as possible. So if there's something I can do now while I know I'm not busy, I'm going to do it now or get as far as I can now. Like I know this weapon's not going to be done for two months, but I know I can set up the final wise containers and events now. So that way, when I get final assets in there, I can kind of just drag and drop. So I think what helps me (laughs) for my personal life isn't great for the sleepless nights is I'm always looking ahead and worrying about what's down the pipe, which also helps me with the team is like, I'm always checking up on people and stuff. Um, letting them know about things that they might not be aware of in terms of dependencies and like, oh, that weapon's ready for you now. And, you know, kind of putting on a little bit of a producer hat every now and then, which is real fun because I love, you know, chatting with everyone in the studio. That's something that, especially as a senior level or or audio lead, you know, I get to talk to everyone because, you know, my, my job is impacted by every single department from concept art to QA. I get to chat with everyone. I think the most stressful part was definitely the cinematics because I've never really shipped linear cinematic stuff before. I'm not (laughs) really a linear person. Um, (laughs) That's kind of why I got into game dev is like, uh, I don't want to sit here and tag five minutes of footsteps. I want to tag 15 run animations and have it done for me. But it was really fulfilling and a great learning experience. We worked with uh, skew sound as a, some external contractors helping me out with the cinematics, but that was definitely stressful because it's not my wheelhouse. So having to up my game there as well as learn on the job in terms of not only more linear sound design than I've done outside of mock-ups and audio tests and that sort of thing, but also linear sound design and surround because we did it in five one and then learning five one in Reaper because that's my wheelhouse was, was all an an additional challenge. And then on top of that, getting to linear sound design, my first project from home because of COVID-19 was an additional, (laughs) (laughs) was a nice curveball to kind of have to deal with, uh, with it all. Yeah. Wow. I'm always interested in when people make that jump up, we all kind of know about each stage but it's the gray area in between that I always love hearing about people making the step up. Yeah. I mean, the game's a huge achievement. I mean, it's really, really awesome sounding and it's gorgeous. Obviously it looks beautiful. So it's nice to have that type of platform to build on, but truly, I mean, it sounds great. And the depth of processing that you did on the voices for that to stick and do the work and still get all the performances, all the emotions so clear and the context so clear is just really, that's not easy to do, man. That was, that's really nice work. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was definitely, I definitely was pretty nervous about that as well. Like not having really gone super deep in VO processing before. And then also having to make sure that these, these robotic characters had emotion was a fun and definitely a, a satisfying challenge to overcome. Cool. So when you're not sounding in gaming, like what kind of other stuff do you do? Like how do you unwind? Um, I do a little bit of music on the side as a aura heavy industry, ORA heavy industry, doing a lot of like drone stuff, just kind of working in game development and sound design. You're focused on like transients and milliseconds. So it's it's <laughs> nice to just kind of like bow an electric bass for like 10 minutes and then just throw, <laughs> throw a reverb on it, chop it up a little bit and then put it on Bandcamp. It's a nice release. And then I also tinker with tape loops and tape players and i'm looking at like four broken tape players that i need to fix and there you go (laughs) there you go well jack you've been in the sound community in my periphery in the sound community for a long time because you were working on designing sound.org and the game audio podcast as well so it's been great to actually talk to you in person as well as a field recording slack jeez uh, yeah, jack been, runs you, all the sound communities just yeah, in case yeah. anyone wanted to know so <laughs> thanks for doing all that because when i went freelance in 2003 i believe i really felt alone for a bunch of years after that because i was working on my own in my own little dark room and then once the internet started developing these sound communities it really made a difference for my both personal growth in my work, as well as just my mental well-being in the work. And you had a lot to do with a lot of that. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks. That's nice to hear. Yeah. A lot of, I think one of the reasons why I try to be involved in the online sound community is because I myself was isolated up until two, 
three, oh God, like about three years ago, I was in North Carolina, which now there's a decent amount of sound developers at some game studios, but especially where I was in Winston-Salem, like I wanted to be in the game industry. I wanted to be in the sound industry, but I'm, you know, living in the backwoods. So reaching out to people online and getting involved in designing sound and game audio hour and being involved on Twitter and forums was kind of the only way I could really talk to peers and collaborate and bounce ideas because I was just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And I'd like to reciprocate to you guys in the game industry. You know, we have some podcasts, but I think even you guys with a bit more of a focus on linear is still an excellent resource for us to listen to. And when designing sound was full steaming ahead, we every once in a while would get questions like, why don't you all do a podcast? And like, well, we don't need to, it's already out there. It's the tone benders. Like <laughs> <laughs> you all were very great at supporting any um, monthly topics that we would set up and help spread the word and get some great ideas and conversations out there. So thank you guys for all you do. Yeah, it's wild how much our orbits have been just parallel for so many years now. <laughs> uh, a nice virtual hug to, to all of us. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. Sky Pi 5. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. This has been a really great talk and uh, congratulations on the game. It's awesome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really excited to get it out there and, and have people take a listen. Yeah, now take a rest. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Tone Benders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. 